Good morning, everyone. First of all, Happy New Year. Wonderful to celebrate the first Sunday, first day of the year together with you. And since we didn't see each other last week, Merry Christmas as well. Um, let's open this morning with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. We're truly blessed to be in your house of worship together, and we're thankful for the gift you've given us of Jesus. The joy of this season as we share the word and the meaning of his birth and ask for your continued blessings through the course of this hour of worship. In the name of your Son, amen. amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Ephesians chapter 5. Um, we're going to start with verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. May the Lord grant his blessing upon the reading of his word. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, the first is that on January 8th, which is next Sunday, all committee reports are due to Jeanette in anticipation of our annual meeting, which will be on the 15th. There will be a fellowship meeting downstairs, also next week, and the deacons will meet next week. Um, today would be a normal meeting for the elders. They won't meet until the first Sunday of February, and we are not going to have um, communion today. Um, on, also, please put in your calendar for the last Sunday of January, the 29th, there will be a um, Super Bowl party downstairs so um, make sure that you attend and flyers for that will be coming out in um, a couple weeks we do have the cards still in the the hallway so please be sure to stop by and make sure that you've picked up all cards that have been written out to you they've been done in love it takes time and effort <laughs> so please be sure you pick them up um, if you finished reading the bible in 2022 uh, would you please write your name down and give it to me or put it in a basket in the North X so that we can honor you um, later this month. Um, the red, what are these poinsettias? Um, if you have donated a poinsettia, your card with your name should be in the flower. Please take it home with you today. If you um, did not donate, but would like to take some home, please do. There were several donated um, from an anonymous benefactor. So we have some flowers that are, that are looking for a good home. So if you want to take some flowers, please come up and, and check them. Um, and finally, a prayer request. Nancy Reynolds um, had emergency neck surgery about a week ago to relieve numbness on her left side. She had a herniated disc in her neck area the operation was successful. She's now able to raise her arm and make a fist, and she is in um, rehab. So please keep Nancy in your prayers. And with that, let's bow our heads and pray for the world. Dear Lord, we come to you together um, with one prayer, and that is to please be with us and our church family, our families um, who aren't able to make it but who watch on YouTube, and all believers around the world who are starting a new year, fresh in the knowledge that Jesus Christ is your Son and He's the Savior of the world. Um, Lord, the first of the year is a day where resolutions are made, and I hope the number one resolution in hearts within this church and with all around the world is that they come closer to Christ and seek salvation. Um, other resolutions are fine for the, for the body, but spiritually we seek you and we ask for your guidance and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing our first hymn today, number 146, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day.
Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. That's page 1,282 in the Bible, if you want to follow along. And it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. May the Lord grant his blessing upon the reading of his word. And we'll stand and sing our second hymn this morning, Angels from the Realms of Glory, number 135 in the hymnal. Now we'll ask the ushers so we can come forward and give unto him our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
let's stand and sing our doxology together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you've bestowed upon us, and we will in turn use those gifts to bless others. May your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, before we get into the special music, I do want to announce that we are going to have a fellowship offering after the, fellow after the special music, so it's not in the bulletin, just a little added piece. Um, and Lori is going to sing for us this morning, Happy Birthday, Jesus. Happy Birthday, Jesus. I'm so glad it's Christmas. All the tinsel and lights, presents on the Lori told me before church started that that was a children's song. I don't think it was. I think it was beautiful. <laughs> now if I could please call the elders forward for our fellowship offering.
Heavenly Father, let us give praise to you and your Son. We thank you, Father, for this time of the year when we can celebrate your precious Son's birth. Father, again, we thank you for the ability to take funds to help the elderly and the people that might need money in the church and in this community. Father, thank you for everything that you do in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 And now Frank is here to bless us on the first Sunday of the year. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, right? Um, did everybody have a nice Christmas? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, we all kind of at Christmas time, we always think about things that we get that are kind of new, don't we? Did you get anything new at Christmas? Anybody get something that was new? Um, or maybe you have grandchildren like I do, <laughs> and you saw them get some new things. Um, I think often at this time of year we give and receive presents, and all, of course, um, that's not what the season's about, but certainly it's, it, there are new things that we see. And kind of as human beings, we gravitate towards new things, don't we? Every, t every day we're looking at, do you watch the news every day? Well, news, new things, right? It's about, it's about new things. Uh, remember when Paul went to, um, to uh, Athens and, he met, and the Athenians, what were they doing? They spent all their time doing what? Talking about every new thing and then Paul actually came up with the new God yeah um, somehow new things uh, tend to fascinate people and and at this very moment right uh, where we are right now today we've just begun a new year and uh, I, I don't know about you but I'm kind of ready to usher out 2022 aren't you 2022 it's kind of what happens every we usher out the old new and in some ways, we, we look at this now as a new year as, as, as hopeful, opportunity, right? We look back on 2022 and we could say, well, there were some good things that happened, but it, you know, there were a lot of challenges, weren't there, last year? As we think about kind of the world scene, we saw a lot of uh, turmoil and pain. We saw a war in Ukraine, and I've, I've watched over and over the atrocities taking place. Uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. I, I look at the United States and I'm saddened by what I saw this year as the progress of the immoral agenda that this country seems to have embraced. I, I bring that up to you because it's so apparent in front of us and, and I don't, I, I'm worried because I watch it affect even now children. We watch in the news how that's being taught in schools and what they now call normal. We, we watched this year's life, th this year too, I think, with inflation. Inflation hit all of us, didn't it, in some way or another. Um, whether or not you were like me, I was supposed to retire this year. <laughs> I, I laugh because, I laugh at that because that was my plan. God's plan wasn't for that. God's plan is always better. But uh, I, you watch the financial markets this year, and um, you know, I, I think that was a difficult year. We've watched a flood of illegal immigration, supply chain shortages. We watched many mass shootings. It's been a difficult year, I think. Um, COVID, which had dominated our lives, I think, in 2020 and 2021, is still a concern. But in some ways, I think that part of, of what we see has gotten a little bit better. It's still out there, uh, but it's left a lot of uh, harm in its wake. And I guess for other people, I don't know, but you may have lost loved ones. I lost my mother this year. That was a, uh, it was a difficult thing to go through. Um, but we're still here, aren't we? By God's grace, we're all still here. And now we're ready to start a new year. And as we look forward to it, it our hope then, we have hope, right? We have hope that this new year won't be worse than last year. We're, we're hoping that it's going to be a lot better. And I hope maybe, and I said something to my daughter last night about 2022, and she said, oh, that was a great year. <laughs> of course, she had a baby, or a new baby family, and I said, have you really reflected? And uh, it was kind of a funny conversation. But, you know, whatever happens, our, the year is new, and we are encouraged, I think. We hope for better things, and we wish one another a happy new year. As, as Christians, though, as we think about things that are new, 
we don't want to get caught away in all new things. We worship a God who never changes. He's always the same. And He's eternal. In Hebrews, it tells us about God and how He doesn't change. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. God, and you some words, is what? Immutable. That means He doesn't change. And I th if we think about that, we can be thankful that God doesn't change. He doesn't change. And I'm not saying we can't get excited about new things, but we can get excited like I did with my granddaughter. But when we think about God who doesn't change and that he's immutable, it creates a sureness that we have in the Lord, isn't it? He's our rock. What he has said, he will do. God's not going to come down the lane here and find something change and say, well, I didn't see that coming. I'm going to change my mind and we're going to do this a different way. No. We have God's sure word. And in Malachi, the Lord says, for I am the Lord. I change not. And so then if, if he doesn't change, we as his people, we can rest in his promises. And that kind of gets us to the, the um, verse that I picked um, well, really, that God led us me toward for the um, sermon today. It's in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5. It says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. God is the one who creates new things. And um, do you, I, I, the context of where this verse falls in the Bible is toward the end of the, chap of the book of Revelation. It follows the scene of the great white throne judgment. We're familiar with the great white throne judgment, right? Where really it's kind of the end of our present creation, our current earth. We see at the end of Revelation chapter 20 where Jesus had come back to reign for a thousand years. And even then, a great many people rebel. It says, as this, I've always fascinated me in Revelation chapter 20, it says, as many people that rebelled against Jesus after he has reigned here for a thousand years, it says, and they were like the sand of the seashore who followed Satan when he is loosed at the end. And it tells us fire comes down. I'm not reading it right now. It's, it's, it's fire comes down from God out of heaven and destroys those adversaries who came against the Lord. And then I saw heaven and earth. It just, it just flies away, and a great white throne comes out, and the dead who were in Hades are resurrected. And as they are, they're given new bodies, and they appear before the great white throne, judgment of Jesus Christ. What happens when you stand there at that judgment, and you are without Christ? What a sad scene we see at, at this great white throne. And it says that, if their that their names were not written in the book of life. They hadn't placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And it says that they were thrown into the lake of fire. It's a horrible scene. It's a, it's a sad scene, and I can imagine, and it tells us God will wipe away. He's going to have to wipe away our tears. And what happens is that heaven and earth is gone, and what we see in Revelation chapter 21 is God coming in then and creating a new heaven and a new earth. And he, it's referred to as the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. And as we see that new Jerusalem then coming down out of heaven, it's God sitting on the throne who says, Behold, I make all things new. So who's the real creator of new things? It's God, isn't it? God is the maker of heaven and of earth. And when we think about the incredible power of God and his ability to create everything that we see now and his ability then at the end here, at the end of this creation to then put a new one in place, it's, it's amazing. He's not only immutable, he doesn't change. He's also what we call omnipotent, isn't he? He's all-powerful. He's the supreme power in the universe. And he does as he pleases. 
And I find it fascinating as I read that particular part of scripture, and I've often read it and reflected on it, but then I thought to myself, I said, well, throughout the whole Bible, it's God who's creating. If we open our Bibles and we go to Genesis chapter 1, now we're in Revelation 21, we're almost at the end there, right? You go all the way back to the beginning, and what's the first verse in the Bible say? In the beginning, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of what we now know, of this creation, God created the heavens and the earth. God creating. There we see it again. And as he did this, do you remember in Job what was happening? What he, when he told us, the angels, then when the more, it says, and when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy as God created our current creation. And when he was done the present creation, what did he say about it? It's very good. In, the, in Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning there, on the sixth day. Don't get confused, by the way, about all these philosophies of mankind, and it was eons and millions of years and all these. That's not what happened. Believe God's word. God created the heavens and the earth. He did it in six days, and if you ever study the Hebrew words that are used in Genesis, you will see there's no clearer way for him to be talking about 24-hour periods. God did it. I could say a lot more on that topic. I won't, because I do science. <laughs> I'm a person that's in the scientific community. But I won't go on. I think the important point I'm trying to make is God is the one who creates it, and he created it very good. But what happened amidst that first creation? At the beginning of this current creation, mankind, he went astray, didn't he? God created everything good, but he gave all of us a choice. He gave Adam and Eve, in this particular instance, a choice to follow and obey him or not. And as we all know, mankind chose to disobey God. And, and I wrote some things here in my notes. That he went his own selfish way, thinking there was something better that God was withholding from him. Think about that, about sin, about when we turn from God. I'm going after something God has either forbidden or said don't do, or, and I think God's with, I think I know better. And so that's what mankind did. They sinned and they missed the mark. They didn't trust God. And all of the heartache, I talked about things that we've seen in 2022 and for many, 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 many thousands of years now, um, all of the heartache that we see at its root is mankind's disobedience to God. Today, look around you. The world systems, our governments, they reject God. They turn their back on God. They believe they have a better way than God's. And I see in our culture today, and I'm not saying this to depress us, I'm saying it as a reality and to be expected, by the way, if we read God's word, that they turn their back on God. They reject what he has said, and they know better. Very similar to what we see with Adam and Eve. Mankind continues in that pattern. And I would say, if you take a look at what mankind is pursuing, his total failures in what we see in our world today is evidence that his way does not work. It's only as we follow God that we can hope, have any hope. You know, I think, too, as, as man fell in the Garden of Eden and he fell, what, is, what happens? Of course, God comes and he talks to Adam and Eve. And even in that first talk with them, what does he do? He creates or he promises a way of reconciliation, of salvation, of moving back to God. He's going to what? The seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. God, even then, even as man turns from him, is creating and is planning a new way to save mankind who can't save themselves. You know, as we, as we look at that and we think about that, we could say, praise the Lord that he did that because I could have never saved myself. God provides salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And as we begin the new year, we can praise the Lord knowing he is the author. He's the finisher of our, both of our faith and our salvation. 
And from we, what we read in the Bible and in his word, and he doesn't change, right? What does he say? He says he intends for all who trust in him to be with him forever. That's your future, Christian, right? You're Christian. If you're a Christian, you've placed your faith truly in Jesus Christ. You have a great future. And as I look at this verse in Revelation, and we're, now we've come through the Bible, the story of this whole present creation. It's kind of exciting as you read the Bible, you know, and you see all these things. And, and you get to this point in Revelation, and it says, Behold! Look at this, he's saying, John's saying. He's saying, look at this. I make all things new. And they're encouraging words, because even amidst all of this turmoil that we, that we live through, I know that God's plan is for me to be with him forever. That's an encouraging thought. And when we get to this place, this new Jerusalem, this eternal dwelling place with the Lord, all of our former troubles, all the things we worry about now, all these concerns that we have, they're going to be forgotten. I often wonder sometimes if God's going to let us play back pictures of history so we can see what happened. And as I read the Bible, I'm thinking, no, we won't want to do that. That's going to be behind us. It's going to be forgotten. We're going to be so enthralled and so amazed at where we are and what we're doing and what, what God is up to and that we're in the presence of God. I think those things will become much less important. John tells us in Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter in the Bible, in verses 3 and 4, he says, there will no longer be any curse. What's he mean by that? Our, the curse that we have now on this creation and, this, and our system now is because of man's sin, because of man's rejection of God. No longer. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. We're going to be there with him. And his bondservants, that's us, will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. We belong to him. You know, as I read these things and I try to get, I'm excited as I read them. And as I tell you about it, I, it's hard because it's hard to comprehend, isn't it? It's hard to really get a grasp of, of all of these things that, that's, that are being told to us, read the last couple chapters of Revelation and read through it. It's helpful, but even then, we only see dimly now, don't we? In, in um, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, speaking of this later time, face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. And so as I, I personally struggle to really get a grasp on all that the Bible's telling me, it says that I see in this mirror dimly. I don't know if you're familiar with, with mirrors in the time of the Bible. All right, didn't I go over that once with us? A mirror back then is not like a mirror we see today, where we see a crisp reflection. Back then, their mirrors were dull. It was more like looking at a piece of silver. And they would take the mirror and they would look around to try to really kind of see what the image looked like. And that's kind of the analogy that's being used here. As we look to this future with the Lord, it's dim. We're getting, we get glimpses of it. We know it's for sure. We know God promised it, but we can't fully see it. We see it dimly now, but then it will be face to face. So as we, as we consider God's future creation, I'd like to begin our new year reflecting on his current creation, how he has created new life in each one of us. Because when we see what God has done and is doing in our lives as, as he creates, it strengthens, I think, our faith in these promises for our future. In Ephesians, what has he done for you? Has God done great things in your life? He's doing great things in our lives, isn't he? It says in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, in him, who, what's that mean? In him, in Christ, that's who we are now. We're we are in Christ, in him, 
you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. He's created new life in each one. Are you a believer here today? God has created new life in you. God did it, not you. We believed, oh, we had to believe, but we didn't create the new life, did we? God does that when we believe. And he's put the Holy Spirit into each and every one of his own believers, as, this, as it talks about here, this down payment, this promise. And it's a guarantee that looks forward to a future redemption. God's not done creating. He's creating a new person in each of us right now as he conforms us to the image of Christ. But on that day, and it speaks of redemption here, of God's own possession, that's us. God will redeem us fully. We will have new bodies and we will see Christ and we will see God face to face and we will be like he is without sin. Praise God for that. This is all to the praise of his glory. I was thinking about the praise of his glory. We, we praise him for the current creation, what he's done, this beautiful world that he's given us, his mercy and grace and providing salvation or new life. I praise him for that, giving it to me. I don't deserve it. And he's working in us now. How patient is God with you? My, my goodness, is he patient with me? And he's loving and he's kind and he's working every single, to think the God of the universe, I thought that this morning when I was praying, I'm thinking, God of the universe, he's listening to me. Wow. Praise God for that, right? And he's working patiently in, in our lives, and he's promised us that he will fully redeem us in the future. Can we confidently rest in what God says he will do? We absolutely can. When he created in Christ Jesus, he set before us a new way of life, one where we now have peace with God and we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. He's made us new creatures. Um, and it began, of course, when we believed the message of salvation that came to us. Um, and what was the message? Well, I think it begins with knowing what and who we are. We're sinners, aren't we? All of us. The Bible says all of us are. And we realized that we were sinners and we were condemned and separated with God and that we didn't really have peace with him. We were without hope. And no matter what we do, we can't work our way back to God. In Romans 3, 19 and 20, and this is a, a message you all know well, but it's a message the world doesn't understand. It says in Romans 3, 19 and 20, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. And here's what I want you to get. Because by the works of the law, working, keeping God's commandments, no flesh will be justified in his sight. You are not justified or made right by keeping the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Be clear about that. It's not your works and the keeping of God's commandments that get you to heaven. That's what he's saying there in Romans. Does that mean we should just not keep God's commandments? Absolutely not. You know, Paul goes on later, he goes, God forbid. You don't know. We, that's not the point. The point is you keeping the commandments is not what makes you right or justified with God. When we are, justi we, we are justified with God, we're justified with God after we believe in Jesus Christ. God has provided the way, but we have to believe God. And that kind of gets back to the beginning problem there at the, in the garden, right? What happened with Adam and Eve? They didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. They trusted in something else, something that they thought was going to be better. It looked good to eat. It was make, make one wise. All those things. Eve said, oh, yeah, this looks great. Adam didn't seem to put up any fight, did he? And so they stopped trusting God. 
and they went their other way. What is believing God with respect to salvation? It's believing God's word, it's believing his truth, it's believing who I am, and it's believing in Jesus Christ as the only way. That's why we read that, that verse this morning. It said, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And, when you, and so a lot of people will try, oh, there are other ways to God. Oh, that's exclusive. Oh, that's wrong. Oh, that's not wrong. No. We believe that. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe God. We believe him not just today. We keep believing in him. And so God has created this way to be reconciled with himself. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith then results in justification before God. Um, what does it mean to be justified? It means to be made right with God, right? That's we, and though we were guilty, how, is that, how does it work in God's plan here, this plan that he created? Though we were guilty, and we all are, there's none righteous, no, not one, we're considered as just by the virtue of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me. His righteousness is imputed to me when I believe. That's the message. That's a hard message for the world, isn't it? The world wants to think they can do it. They think through some efforts of their own, they will please God or make their way to God. They even have the yin and the yang, right? I do more more of one, and it starts to balance out. If I do more good than I do bad, well, God will like me. It doesn't work that way. Our path to eternal glory is faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that we have to understand about that faith. We have faith at a point in time in what God has said, and we are saved. There is a point where we come to true faith in Jesus Christ. But faith doesn't end there. In Romans, it tells us that the just will live by faith. We live every single day by our faith in Jesus Christ, in God's word, in his truth. Every day I trust God. That's the way Christians live. Oh, don't get me wrong. We have our doubts. We have our problems. I'm not saying those things don't happen. But it's a blessing that God has done it and provided this way of salvation. If God had to provide a way of salvation where I had to earn it, we'd all be in big trouble, wouldn't we? But he didn't. God made, he created something new, and that was the way to himself, back to himself, through Jesus Christ. And what happens when we place our faith in Jesus Christ? We have a new relationship, don't we? God creates a new relationship between us and himself that wasn't there before. Oh, you may have said a prayer, you may have done, but you really weren't communing or in communication with God, but you are now. We were dead, if you will, to God, but now we're alive. The Holy Spirit dwells in me, and I have an open channel to the Lord, to the throne. I know, do you, that God hears and he answers my prayers. I was watching a rerun episode of The West Wing. Anybody ever watch The West Wing? It's about Washington, D.C. Of course, my whole life has been around government. So the West Wing is one of them I like. And it's about the president and all of his, his people that support him, right? And they're all, always running around and they're trying to solve problems. And he's in this one episode and the president's trying to make a decision. Should I pardon a murderer? And he's struggling with it and he's visited by a Catholic priest who asked the president, Mr. President, have you prayed to God for wisdom on this. And I'm really, I'm listening to this, and I'm going, I pray to God for wisdom all the time, right? I'm listening, and, and all of a sudden, he sa and, and he says, and the president says, yes, I've prayed to God for wisdom. And the priest says, um, well, has he answered? And, the, and, I'm, and I'm voicing it in here. 
every time. I'm voicing as I'm watching the TV, right? And the president says, no, never. And I'm going, what? And uh, I, I would conclude it that this was a secular show that really knew nothing about praying and about prayers to the Lord. God tells us to pray to, for, to him for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, right? In the beginning of James. But don't doubt, you know, don't be... Pray for wisdom and he will give it. God always answers our prayers. It may not be in the time or exactly the way we expect, but God always answers our prayers. And I have that relationship with him. I have a new relationship too, and it makes the Bible come alive. I remember when I first began that relationship, I was reading the Bible constantly. I couldn't believe all the things I was learning from the Bible. And still, God's word is the way he directs my life today. It is through prayer. It is through reflection, and I encourage reflection. I encourage reading his word and reflecting on his word. How does God provide us direction? It is through his word. Are you reading his word and say, now, what does that mean to me now? So I'll give you an example. I'm trying to illustrate this so you, we all do this. I think so it's helpful. How do we take God's word and apply it to our lives? I was reading through First and Second Chronicles. How are you going to apply that to your life? Right? For, yeah, first and, remember Kings, the books of Kings in the Old Testament, follow both the southern Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. So it tells you about all the kings, and up in Israel, they were always bad. Just about always bad. Down in Judah, though, there were a lot of good ones. And when you read Chronicles, Chronicles focuses on the southern kingdom of Judah. And I'm reading through, you know, you read about Solomon. Aren't you disappointed in Solomon by the end of his life? You know, and as you read through a lot of these kings, many were pretty good kings. And as I read through it, I kind of concluded that some were good, some were good and bad, and some were just bad. And as I read through it all, I said, God, what do you want me to learn from this? I was in prayer in the morning, and I'm trying to reflect, what is it that I should learn? Boy, did it come clear to me. It was very clear. The first thing is that many kings did worse, not better, in their older age. What do you pray? God, please help me. I don't know how many years I've got left, but I'm in my older age. I want to follow you. The second thing is that many kings were good and followed God, but many of them not with a whole heart. Did you ever read there? This was king blah, 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 and he followed the Lord and he did good, but he didn't get rid of... So he was following the Lord kind of in a good way, but he wasn't really completely dedicated to the Lord. And I said, Lord, here's a lesson to be learned. I pray that I can follow you 100%, not 90%, not 80%, 100%. And the other thing I learned is that the actions of the kings had consequences, whether they followed the Lord or not. And it was harmful not only to the king when they didn't, but to the people around him. God's word is our guide, isn't it? There's always lessons to be learned, no matter what. You, and even if you're not quite, I sometimes have problems following the story in, the, in those Old Testament stories. I use uh, commentaries and things, but, but as I read it and I reflect, and, it, and it's not when you're reading it you necessarily get it. It's that reflection. As you seek the Lord daily, and as you say, Lord, what would you have me to learn? As you go to his word every day, Lord, what would you have me to learn? That's our new relationship. Our new relationship that God has created is one where we can come to him freely in prayer, and it's one where he provides instruction for our lives. And when we have this new life, it gives us different feelings, it gives us new desires, and it gives us a new behavior. I, I, I hope that from the moment you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you knew that you had new life. Do you know that? I mean, we have our physical bodies and all, and we're, our physical bodies are nourished by food and water and exercise and those things, but this eternal life which God has now given us is nourished by these other things I'm talking about through prayer and His Word. 
We're new creatures, the Bible says. We're not what we were. If you don't see that, then I say you need to reassess and you really need to consider, have I truly placed my faith in Jesus Christ? But if you have, you're a new creature. And I like these words. I think Spurgeon used it. You began a new career, didn't you? It's different. I don't know if I've told, I probably told you this story, but in my yearbook in high school, it says I'm going to go off and um, get a job and go to college and be rich. What a wonderful aspiration. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's not so funny when I look at it, but it's funny because, well, look at the aspiration. Well, you're really off course, Frank. Way off course. But when you play, I placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I began a new career. That's not my objective. It's to serve the Lord. Well, we're not all that, we're go- that we uh, will be. But we're certainly, I think, not what we used to be. And as for myself, I have a consciousness now that I am a new person in Jesus Christ. And I can almost tell you that's as sharp as a reality as my own physical existence. I know it. I know that I'm more than I was before, and I can feel it in my life. You know, this higher life, this new life that God has put in us, often contends with our lower self, doesn't it? And by that very fact, we know that that new life is there. And I don't know if you get into struggles, or I'm sure you all do, and you run into things where you want to behave a certain way, and God's Word says something different, and you may not be right on course through this whole thing. Maybe you're angry, or you're holding a grudge, or somebody said something to insult you. That's when you need to go to the Lord. And that's when you need to bring to remembrance His Word and what it says. And I don't know about you, but I will cry out to the Lord, and it doesn't happen in two seconds. It happens over a period of time. And I ask God to forgive my sin and draw me near to Him. Bring me close to you, Lord. Relieve these burdens I have. That doesn't necessarily mean He solves all my problems. But He takes away that pressure, that concern, that angst that I have that I'm waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning because of. And then he helps me see my way clearly. And again, it isn't always about just solving the problem I think I have, but it's about how God wants me to behave in this situation. What would God have me do right now? One of the things he's teaching me right now is to be content. Are you content? Or are you kind of anxious for something to happen the way you want it to happen? I'm like that. I'm always. <laughs> but I'm learning. God is teaching me how to be content. And so as we have this new life that God's created in us, in a way, it's got its hand on the throat of my old flesh. The old flesh is still there and struggling, isn't it? But I see more times than not the new life having the victory. And we can praise God for that because no one but Jesus Christ could create life in me that's able to overcome my old nature. God does that. I hope God's working in your lives the same way. We face similar struggles, don't we? And so do all people who've placed their faith in Jesus Christ. God is working in us. He's working in us to create people he wants us to be and that person he wants us to be is in the image of Jesus Christ which is why in our Bibles it's a great thing to read about the life of Jesus Christ and look at how he responds in all of these situations as I look around the world today again it makes me concerned it's in turmoil isn't it Our world is really groaning and in turmoil, and people feel uncertain and uneasy. But I'll tell you this, God is still working. Sometimes you think he's not, but he's still working. You know, I was watching um, an interview on one of the news shows, and there was a man who came on, I don't even remember what his name was, and he described how he had recently had a newborn son. 
and how this was changing his life. And when he saw the miracle of his son's birth, he concluded there must be a God. And he started to look into the Bible and into Christianity, and his whole life changed. And he said he was contrasting God's truth in the Bible and the current culture, which has no answer and is so drastically opposed to religion and Christianity in particular. He talked about that the current culture is one that wants your faith to be put into the government as your provider and has man's morality as your guide. And I thought to myself, that's humanism. And it's so clearly viewed false, falsely of how, error, how much of an error it is when we view it through the lens of God's word. And I, I saw that interview and I said, I said to myself as I watched that, of all the bad things we hear on the news, and I saw this and I said, there's a light of hope. God's still working, isn't he? If God was done working, Jesus Christ would come and, and we, would, we would be done, but he hasn't come yet. God is still working. A better age is coming, God's word tells us. It's really coming. And listen to what John says about it in the beginning of Revelation, chapter 21, even as the old creation is now done away with. He says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, and neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. God's word is true. It's faithful. He doesn't change. He's omnipotent. If he says he's going to do this, is he going to do this? You better believe it. This is exactly what God is going to do. When it says behold here, and John's saying, behold means to pause a second and look. Behold what, is, what God is doing. New means that these things that he's creating are new in character. This is a new world God will create. We often refer to this as the eternal state. God goes on to say in Revelation 21 in verses 6 and 7, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. He's the Alpha and the Omega, isn't he? He's the beginning and the end of the present creation, of the next creation. He transcends it all. He's the eternal God. He is the one who creates. He says, I will give you of the water of life freely. All you have to do is believe him. And how many people still reject the Lord? Pray for them. Have you accepted God's offer? I hope so. If not, today's the day of salvation. The Bible tells us that. God's work deserves our attention. We should look at his promises. We as believers should rest on these truths. He has great things in store for us. And I would encourage you today as we begin a new year, things are gloomy out there and all those circumstances are, are a problem. But we can rest on what God will do and what he's doing. I was asking my daughter last night, I said, do you know the difference between happiness and joy? And she kind of laughed. And I said, happiness comes from our circumstances. We can be happy in one or unhappy because of circumstances. Joy transcends circumstances. Knowing all of these things about the Lord and who we are in him and what he's doing, that gives us joy. 
And though our circumstances can change, we have the joy of the Lord in us. I, I, I think that, you know, as children of God, as his people, when he says, behold, I make all things new, I think that this is something we have to consider because sometimes we worry under the difficulties of the world, don't we? We worry about them. Sometimes you might even grow dull in the things of the Lord. It can happen to Christians. It happens to me too. And that's when I need to get back to his word. That's when I need to get back to his promises. That's when I need to be back in communion. Bring me near to you, Lord. Do you think God wants us to go through life worrying and depressed? What did Jesus say? He's, he's here to bring us life and have it more abundantly. And as we go through our lives, I'll close with this one section um, in Colossians that we were studying recently. How does God want us to live our lives? Let me just read this section to you real quick. Beyond all these things, put on love. That word's agape, right? That means loving others sacrificially. Put on that kind of love which is the perfect bond of unity, he says. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You know what the peace of peace is there? The umpire. Whenever you're in a situation and you have, and you're in that situation and you may be contending or what do you seek? I seek peace. That might mean putting down, that might mean you don't get your own way. That might mean that just because you're right, you're going to put that aside because I'm going to let the peace of Christ rule him, be the umpire, be the judge, and he chooses peace. That's who I am. I'm a peacemaker. That's how God wants us to live our lives. He says, and be thankful. Are you thankful, people, every day for what God has done, the good with the bad? Job said it, right? Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. There's his word again. Even when you're not quite sure why you're reading some of these things and what God has for you, read it. Let his word dwell in you richly with all wisdom. How are you ever going to get wisdom if you don't know his word? And it says with teaching and admonishing one another, helping other people with what you've learned, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. As we do these things, by the way, doing all those things, that's Colossians 3, 14 through 17. Go read that. That's a really good section of God's word about how he wants us to live. And as we look at those things, I would encourage you to live that way and be sure you can't do it. You can only do it through the power of God in you. That Holy Spirit who he's given us is the one who enables us to actually live lives the way God intended and when you do that, here is the new person God's creating in you. He's creating new right now, and he's doing it right in you. Behold, he says, and he creates all these things that are new. We're new people. Each day, we're, we're closer, I hope, growing closer and closer to the Lord. And why do sometimes we don't always, we, when we drift away from him, that's the problem we often have. We don't stay focused on, we can drift away or our circumstances sometimes overwhelm us. Move back. Move back and go get closer again to the Lord. Oh, this is the last part, I promise. Spurgeon said this, and I, I couldn't get, I couldn't, I want to read it to you. He says this, he says, there are many Christians who live on a very low platform, and that's a sad place to be. Instead of rejoicing and living, we can sometimes really live on a low platform. He said this. He said, many Christians seem to live in the marshes always. Are you down in the marshes? And he says, if you go through the valleys of Switzerland, I never have, but I'll believe Spurgeon on this. He says, you will find yourself getting feverish and heavy in spirit. And you'll see many idiots and persons with sicknesses and people greatly afflicted down in the marshes, down in the valley. Climb the sides of the hills, ascend into the Alps, and you will not meet that kind of thing in the pure, fresh air. But many Christians are of the sickly valley breed. Oh, that they could get up 
to the high mountains. If you've been living in bondage or far from the Lord, draw near to him. Confess your sin. Ask him to enable you to do these things. Read those places I just pointed to in Colossians. Read Ephesians chapter 4. Read these places in your Bible. I want you to read the whole thing, but I know you guys were just doing all the whole year. That's great. But then focus on these. How does God want me to live? He's creating something new. This is a new year. How are you going to use me this year, Lord? Are you thinking about that? How God's going to use you this year? What new thing can God create in my life? And how can he use me now? Praise God, he will. If you seek him as a Christian, he will use you. He uses all of us in different, we all have, all of us have different gifts. We all have a gift that God has given us, or many. Are you seeking to serve him? Love is sacrificing self for God and for others. Sacrifice what you think you want. And turn it over to the Lord and ask him what he wants. Follow the Lord, and he's going to create all things new. Trust in the Lord, because he's going to do all this. It's only a short time until we're there with the Lord. And this time, he wants us to serve him, sacrifice ourselves. He will create new opportunities. He will create new things in our lives. And we praise God for that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us, your grace toward us, all of the things you are doing and all the promises you have. It's overwhelming, Lord. We just thank you. And I pray for each one here that this year, today, Lord, that we would move forward looking for your guidance and your grace and what you would have for us in this coming year. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn for today. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 137 in the hymnal.
with this in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4. It says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen.